Hey, we should be live. Hooray! I hope we're live. Hooray! <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is title in progress. No, uh, ready up rambling. We don't know what to call it, honestly. Uh, we had some awesome names for this show, but they were all taken. Basically. No. <laughs> uh, so basically, this is going to be uh, a little video show where we discuss uh, what's happening in gaming. Uh, right now, and some other stuff. Uh, it's just a sort of uh, kind of a news show, but also discussion. It's not quite a podcast, but, but it's, it's along the same lines, I suppose. Uh, in the background, you may notice that I've got Overwatch on. I recorded these matches last night. Uh, I'd recorded some the previous night, but they went even worse than last night, which were pretty bad as well. Uh, so please don't judge me on the performance there. Um, with me tonight is Susan. Hello. Hello. Uh, I might be doing these on my own in future, but I'm very pleased to have Susan here. Um, Hooray! We're going to discuss a couple of different topics. Um, we have done some research and got some notes ready. Um, and I figure we'll just get into it. Uh, the first topic, and I'll, I'll use my amazing OBS powers to make this appear in real time. Watch this, you ready? <gasps> okay. Longest 20 seconds of my life! <laughs> oh, I suppose, yeah, you're kind of locked behind that. Okay, so, uh, rather appropriately considering we've got Overwatch footage up in the background, uh, the first topic for tonight is the new Overwatch hero. Uh, and this is quite a detailed saga if we go back, but that's why I'm here, to explain it all. Uh, and uh, as, as you may or may not know, uh, there has been two new heroes introduced to Overwatch since it initially launched last May, May 2016. And the game launched with uh, 21 heroes. Uh, and every hero is effectively um, one of four classes, like offense, defense, support, or a tank, basically. Uh, and it makes up the, the core of the game, uh, which is just a, a variation on Team Fortress, let's be honest. Uh, it's basically Team Fortress 2. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so anytime uh, a new hero is introduced, the meta for the game dramatically changes. Uh, in fact, the game, the, the meta for the game dramatically changes every time there's a minor content patch. Um, and characters are adjusted in any way. Uh, but when, when, it's, when a hero is introduced, it's big news, because it can mean a, a dramatic change to uh, team compositions. Mm -hmm. um, and the strengths and weaknesses of heroes versus other heroes, basically, because uh, a new hero might be better at their job. Uh, so, the one that we've been waiting for for a while now, and has been talked about in talked about and teased, was a character named Doomfist. And Doomfist goes right back to the initial lore reveals for Overwatch. In the very first CG trailer we had. Um, Two or three of the characters who are currently in Overwatch now, Tracer, Winston, uh, some members of Talon, which is the bad Overwatch, uh, they were all fighting over this uh, this gauntlet, um, which was Doomfist's gauntlet. Um, and despite the fact that it appeared in the very first trailer, uh, or opening cinematic, we haven't actually seen uh, anything of Doomfist yet. But there's there's little hints in the game, There there's illustrations and things. Um, and so, more recently, uh, he has been teased by way of uh, a, cer a one certain Terry Crews, who you all may know as the P -p -p Power Man from Old Spice, or uh, more recently, you might know him from Brooklyn Nine Nine. Terry loves his yogurt. Uh, <laughs> so Terry Crews himself, on his own personal Twitter, expressed interest in voicing an Overwatch character. And everybody basically uh, joined in unison to scream, please voice Doomfist. It would be perfect because Doomfist is supposed to be um, uh, a, a man of, of similar ethnic descent and similar voice, and based on what we know anyway, what little we know. Um, and it seemed sort of perfect for him. Uh, plus, we all just want to hear Terry Crews in, in, in more video games. Like, that just sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we were all we were all set when he went to visit Blizzard about two months ago. Mm-hmm. We thought, right, that's it. Hero number twenty four is going to be Doomfist. But uh, contrary to that, Jeff Kaplan, the game director who shows up in many many Overwatch patch note videos. Uh, which have been remixed on YouTube in hilarious fashion. Uh, Jeff Kaplan said in the forum, uh, it's not who you think it is. And this set off the entire community. Uh, Speculation started to run rampant, and we were like, oh, what's happening with Doomfist? I guess we're not getting Doomfist. Um, Following up from this, a whole bunch of stuff has happened in the last two days, the last 48 hours. Um, Blizzard released a blog post, um, which is set in lore... Uh, in in the universe's lore uh, for Overwatch um, about a new character uh, named uh, Ife Olendale Deli um, apologies if I've not pronounced that correctly who is a young female scientist from Numbani, uh, Bani which is one of the maps in the game already and it's also coincidentally the map where uh, you're escorting the Doomfist gauntlet hmm uh, but this is, this is awfully circular and yes uh, I, I mean this... I, I imagine like to anyone who doesn't play overwatch like me this is just like pfft. there's layers going on here just <laughs> yeah, add, like just add to it mess. further uh when one of the previous characters was introduced sombra uh she was a hacker type uh there was an entire arg augmented reality game whatever there was an entire arg introduced by blizzard for uncovering sombra's identity and Blizzard, mm. by their own admission, did a really poor job of that. Um, and uh, so, by comparison, this is fairly minor confusion. Uh, mm. The whole Sombra saga was just a total mess, but it's all sorted now. Um, so that's weird. We got this. Uh, we got all this information about a young female scientist, like really young. We're talking like ten or something, who. Uh, we assume would be this Doomfist character now because of the connection on Numbani. Uh, but no, uh, another piece of information leaked uh, back on the 9th of January, and this could be total nonsense, but it does line up perfectly with some of the information we've received since then, including uh, correctly predicting uh, one of the skins in the Lunar New Year event. Uh, they had said that. Uh, this new character is, in fact, not Doomfist. They are a arachnid robot uh, called uh, Ankora, because uh, I assume it's some poor pun on the fact that the character is to be some sort of anchor uh, and is also an arachnid. Um, now, what I mean by anchor is that um, Overwatch is set up in such a way that has... Uh, a very heavy reliance on uh, on the tank roles in the game, so the likes of uh, Diva, who you've seen probably seen the person in the big mech. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, she's kind of the gamer stereotype. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reinhardt, who is a big, jolly, angry, jolly German, uh, with a, a holographic sort of reflective shield thingy, um, and then there's the likes of Winston, and there are other tanks, but. It's it usually, it's usually between um, Diva, Reinhardt, and Roadhog when it comes to holding the line. Let's say, uh, but the speculation coming out of this is that uh, Ancora will be a new a new Reinhardt specifically. Reinhardt is al- is the absolute strongest in terms of those tanks uh, because of his shield, um, and so he ends up just sort of slowly moving with the payload in a lot of games. Like, if you're watching the footage right now, uh, you'll see that the character I was playing just walked past the payload, which is, like, this uh, the main objective in some of the maps. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a typical strategy is to have Reinhardt stand with his shield on the front of that payload as it moves. And so it can seem like Reinhardt doesn't get a lot to do sometimes. Um... And so another character to break that up uh, might be quite good for the meta uh, or for uh, team compositions in general, uh, make things a bit more interesting for newer players. Uh, but for the really hardcore like people who play this hours upon hours upon hours, uh, what they care about is what this will do to um, team compositions in general. 
Uh, so we, as I say, we know very little about this new character, but it does sound like she's going to be a new Reinhardt. Uh, and that brings up the that brings up the question: Do we really need a new Reinhardt? I was going to say, does um, does the inclusion of this type of character, because like you were saying, there's a very fine sort of balance and yeah, it's uh, any 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 sort of change like this can dramatically change how the game is played. Mm. Like for the first week of Anna and Sombra, who were the two new characters added post release, uh, people just didn't know what to do with them. Uh, Anna in particular, I remember, where people were just like, what is this character, a healing sniper? Uh, but then they worked out you could have her position far away and um, like heal the tanks from miles away. Uh, and she was also very good at um, shutting down healing on the enemy team because she has a grenade that disables that. Um, but yeah, so if a new character is introduced, it, it always messes up the entire game. Uh, or at least messes with the balance. And it takes Blizzard a little while, a couple of patches usually, to, to fine-tune that, to get it right. Uh, but the interesting thing about Reinhardt is Reinhardt is probably the only character that since launch has basically not been touched. They, they got him right immediately. Every other character, uh, from the famous Bastion, the robot that sort of stands around and people were salty about and is actually not that hard to get rid of, um, mm. to... Diva, my favourite character, she's had some significant changes in uh, recent patches. She's no longer as much of a threat anymore, which may be sad, uh, but people were saying she had no real counter and she was too flexible, so... Uh -huh. um, all, almost every character has had some significant changes made. Symmetra's another good example. She was a sort of really strange character who just sort of set up like laser turrets and didn't really do anything else. Um, and would set up a, her ultimate, which is a, a technique that uh, charges up over a match and can usually change the tide of an entire match if used correctly. Her ultimate was just to set up a teleporter, um, so it wasn't very offensive. But then they completely rebalanced uh, Symmetra so, such that she sort of became an offensive character, even though she's technically classified as support. Um, so the changes that Blizzard make... Uh, in the PTR, which is the public test realm, um, and push on to the game can uh, just dramatically change how it plays. Um, this isn't like Team Fortress where uh, you had nine character classes and mm -hmm. items affected how the characters played, but if if there was ever a problem with that, they would just adjust the item. Or uh, The problem with introducing an entirely new hero is that they have to if they want to rebalance that, a lot of the time they'll have to completely rethink that character. Um, so it gets, it gets into sort of dangerous territory and the forums are just like the seas of salt. The You cannot, <laughs> like, um, we had Verity on, on Monday talking about the meta in uh, Gwent. But uh, I can't even I can't even explain how insane the blizzard forums are uh but then again that's what you get from a community that's probably partly moved on from team fortress 2 and partly moved on from world of warcraft you're sort of combining a really crazy mixture there. two very fanatic yes um, yeah absolutely and, and you know and diablo as well uh yeah you've yeah, got you've course. got fan bases there who are hugely passionate about their products but mm. will also be hugely critical with them um because of the passion uh, so I'm curious what this character will end up being once they're actually introduced. Uh, they even showed up, uh, the, curiously enough, uh, some arachnid robot actually showed up in some early concept art from BlizzCon 2015. Um, and the rest of the characters in the concept art are all in the game already. Uh, it's just, it wasn't, this arachnid robot wasn't. So it'll be, yeah. it'll, it'll be curious to see that be introduced. Now, the current uh, estimation for when this might actually be implemented is... Yeah, that was my next question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the current estimation is the 14th of March, based on what happened with Sombra and Anna. Usually, it was a couple of weeks before Blizzard almost like fully teased it. Then they introduced the character to the PTR, and then about four or five days later, after playing player testing, and assuming nothing was really broken about the character, which is possible, uh, then they will push it to live. Yeah. Um, so, 
I'm curious what this character will do uh, to the game. I play Overwatch with a, a, dis a dedicated group of people on a Discord server. And they're all way better than me, by the way. I am I am the weak link. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not bad. But these are these are guys who have got like rank like three, four, five hundred. Um, and if you're watching the footage right now, you'll see that my rank is it says thirteen with a star, which means uh, I'm rank one hundred and thirteen. Uh, but these people are like three, four, five, six hundred. Um, they play constantly. They play competitive mode. I didn't even bother with competitive season three. I did try seasons one and two, uh, but I just thought it got too intense for me at that point. Uh, and so. I'm seeing a lot of chatter about um, Doomfist and um, and Korra and what they'll both do to this game, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to see what it'll do to the game because uh, I really like this game, um, and it, I mean for me it is the sort of spiritual replacement for TF2. No one really plays TF2 anymore, which is a shame mm. uh, because in some ways TF2 is almost better balanced than Overwatch because it's got fewer variables to screw everything up there's only nine characters um but yeah uh i guess we'll stand by for that and look forward to that uh in the coming weeks so the 14th of march is our estimate right now 14th of march okay um so that's it really for overwatch stuff i mean there are some other things going on uh diva is uh well as i say she had a significant patch change a couple, like about a month ago and she we sort of just call her tissue paper now. Um, and uh, Bastion's having some changes as well to make him more useful, which is ironic considering at launch everyone thought he was a nightmare, but then they just worked out the ways to shut him down. Uh, they're now trying to make him more of a threat. Um, but I think it worked. I don't know how I feel about that. I think it worked him being uh, less of a threat once you've learned the game because he was a good beginner character. Uh, it, that was kind of his role. Okay, he doesn't show up in competitive much, but he's there to sort of teach some of the basics. Um, it's specifically a lesson about thinking that there's a an enemy offensive line or defensive line that you can't overcome, but you can. You just need to think around it. Um, so it was a good it was a good lesson in that. I think that's that was Bastion's job before, and I'm worried what he'll be if they try and make him more of an actual threat. Um, but other than that, I think that's it for Overwatch news. Um, Hooray! Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> barely barely understood what was going on. Barely understood what was happening. <laughs> uh, oh my god, we've got a whole bunch of chat going on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was keeping myself occupied with some... Scott giving us the doom gist of things, says a regular Johnny. Yep. Uh, yeah, we had some excellent punnage back and forth. This is from. rather so... <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Why isn't this called Ramble Up? That's a good one, okay, yeah. Uh, and Verity we'll is... Later. So Verity is asking us, when is this the Gwent segment? Well, Verity, you can have your own Gwent segment if you like, but I'm afraid I wouldn't <laughs> be able to comment on that. I barely understood what was going on in your game last time. Kind of feels like what I feel like right now. Yeah, see, yeah, that we're on similar, <laughs> similar ground there. Um, but, uh, so we'll, I guess we'll move on to our second topic then. Cool. Uh, so, uh, now that we've exhausted Overwatch, let's move on to the Nintendo Switch. Oh my god, what a shock. We're going to talk about the Nintendo Switch. No one's talking about it. No, everyone's talking about it. Um, as we draw ever closer to the 3rd of March launch of the Nintendo Switch, despite the fact that there is only really two or three games at launch, uh, the hype machine has gone into crazy overdrive. Mm. Um, especially in the last week, uh, because there have been a, a couple of uh, interesting events with regards to embargoes. Uh, so the first thing that happened is that a NeoGAF user, slash Reddit, uh, named uh, Hip Hop the Robot, mm -hmm. Hip Hop the Robot uh, acquired a Switch early, um, and he claims that he was just shipped it from a retailer, which he wouldn't name because he didn't want them to give them uh, to get them into trouble. He claims that it was uh, just a, just an early shipment. Uh, he's just a normal guy, and he happened to end up with a Switch. That was his story, and he was sticking to it. Uh, I'll get back to that in a second, but the initial thing we got out of that was we got to see a video of him unboxing the Switch, 
and a video of him turning it on an initial UI boot up, uh, which to someone like me is is uh, really interesting stuff because I like to see how the system back end works, and it gives us a better understanding of the the end the final features in the product. I mean, there's been a lot of speculation with regards to things like, let's say, the Virtual Console, which we've heard zilch about um, over the over the next couple of weeks. Um, so, link to said video or? Oh uh, yeah, I did actually. I linked to everything or? else. Oh no, no, it's down there. It's down there. It's in the unboxing that- section. Um, so, um, yes. Uh, he showed off this video with the UI and an unboxing and everything. Um, GUI is extremely Android-like, so the user interface when you pop it on, it's really simple, uh, really minimalist, uh, but it's got the sort of configuration options you would expect, and it wouldn't surprise me if it was some sort of advanced uh, Android skin, uh, because the thing is basically an Nvidia shield for anyone who understands the hardware in the Nintendo Switch. Um, I was very happy to see that uh, the there were region settings right there in the GUI. Like that's that's brilliant. Uh, I wonder how those will work. I'm spe- specifically wondering how uh, DLC will work with regards to, let's say you've got a PAL game, a European cartridge, you put that in the system, but you're on the US eShop. How does that work if you want to buy like the Zelda expansion patch uh, pass? Uh, which was recently announced. So, uh, yeah, it's good to see stuff about the the region uh, popping up in there. Uh, Hey, Johnny has popped in to say NVIDIA Shield TV. It's an NVIDIA Shield TV. Yeah, that's that's what I was basically saying. It was, yeah. Um, Or a Shield tablet with the Shield TV. Yeah, without the TV's APU, yes. That's Mm. basically what I meant, yeah. Uh, so it's, it is effectively that, and that's why I was thinking, oh, this this UI is very Android-like. Um, so we'll get we'll get more confirmation of that next week. Um, but anyway, this basically led to an explosion of inquiries over at NeoGAF, uh, the masking hip hop, all sorts of questions about little the little niggly details that you like to know before launch, because Nintendo's barely shared any of them with us, uh, and. Out of that, uh, it drew significant attention. There was a video uh, that started, honestly, about an hour after it went up, it was at like 140,000 views. Um, and uh, has since been rehosted several times. Uh, following that, uh, obviously, Nintendo of, of America twigged that something was up um, and got in contact with Mr. Hip Hop. Um, requesting that uh, what he had was stolen property, and that they mm. return uh, that they yeah I should say they I don't know if, I don't know if hip hop's a mister that's a bad assumption to make. Um, requesting that they return it to Nintendo. Uh, apparently there are some uh, property laws in the U.S. with regards to pre uh, prior to release date. Uh, it's still Nintendo's property even if he paid for it. Something along those lines anyway. Uh, so, uh, he did that, uh, he apologised, uh, he did not reveal who his supplier was. Um, protect the source! <laughs> protect the source. Um, and oh, it went dear. on his merry way back to Nintendo. Um, oh, such so sweet, 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 sweet moments. So we, we thought that was the end of it. And he did try and connect it to the eShop, by the way. For those wondering about the virtual console like I am, and the eShop in general. Uh, there was a very nifty news page on the home UI that he checked out, and I, I, I stole a screenshot of Toad from that, who's looking terrified and saying, How do we charge? Ah! Um, which is on our Twitter, it's adorable. Uh, but the, the rest of the interface was, a lot of it was locked out due to a system update that was required. Uh, so, day one patch, as expected. Um, so that's all we're going to see of it for the moment, or at least we thought so. Uh, following up, less than two days later, German newspaper Bild, uh, and I uh, I did some investigation of this with, uh, I have a friend in Germany, and I asked her about this, and she told me that Bild is effectively the US equivalent of the Sun. 
But the German equivalent of the sun. Oh, sorry, yeah, the German. Where did I get used to? Uh, the German equivalent of the sun. Um, so they have been known in the past to not uh, take the greatest of caution with uh, NDAs, um, with discretion of privacy, like all of those issues. They've, they're not the best of it, apparently. And that showed in the video that they made immediately after receiving their neon switch. Um, they started a 48 minute live stream filmed on an iPhone in 360p with the, <laughs> with the footage reversed. So really top quality production value. Like, and honestly, I think they were just using the iPhone's mic as well. It was like, it was real garbage show. Um, I, like you would think, you know, they've been given a switch, they're on the press list. They've got this lovely, what looked like a decent office, but they can't set up a room to, to properly review the tech. But never mind. Who knows about the how their uh, work environment works? You uh, you got you got to love the um, the kind of audacity of just jumping straight on it. Oh yeah, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. It was like that's, listen. That's, what, that's just what they. That's just what they. They didn't even try. They were just like straight in. Okay, let's yeah, put this online. And, and why not? Because the appetite for it is of for any kind of knowledge. Page views. Enough. Page views. Page views. Yeah. That's, that's all they wanted. And, exactly, and that's uh, totally what they achieved. And that's totally what they achieved. Uh, and even more hilariously, as far as I'm concerned, uh, oh no, Johnny's in the chat. Germans, mate, Germans can't do tech and listen. Oh, stop, Johnny, stop. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah, they did a horrible job of filming it and everything. Uh, best bit of the video is when, like, 10 minutes into the video, they open up the box, there is a letter in the box, and it's very clearly the NDA from Nintendo. Which Eurogamer also oh. received, and in Eurogamer's video, they read out the endings, and it was bolded and underlined, saying, you can only show the box this week. Next week, you can unbox it, and then on the week of release, you can actually show the console properly. Um, what did build do? Well, they saw that piece of paper, and they put it to the side and said, that's probably not important. Um... And then proceeded to live stream console unboxing. Uh, we got to very briefly see the Pro controller. Um, they tried to hook it up to their Wi-Fi, and I believe they had some issues with that, so they couldn't even get it online. Um, so <laughs> hilarious mess again. Uh, Nintendo not super happy about this. Uh, for a contrast. Yeah. You might want to check uh, Eurogamer's video, where uh, they did follow the NDA correctly, and it's a fairly amusing video of Ian and uh, Chris from Eurogamer, and they're like, Ian, Ian, this is already leaked everywhere. <laughs> what are we doing this for? Uh, and they're like, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, just hands up. Mm -hmm. This is this is we need the clicks. I don't know. Um, yeah, because traditionally, what well, you know, if you didn't have any of those, uh, like the reason for the embargoes, you would uh, the reason you would obey the embargoes is because you wouldn't, they wouldn't touch you with a barge pole ever again if you disobeyed the embargo. Yeah. yeah. But I guess like at that point, build would just kind of just like <laughs> do it for the views. Yep, absolutely. So that was that was clearly the attitude they had for the the whole affair. In more official uh, avenues, let's say. Uh, Nintendo of Europe actually unboxed their uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild limited edition today. And uh, I think that's probably one of the cutest unboxings I've ever that, watched. That was, <laughs> it was adorable. Uh, it was probably, you know, probably made slightly more adorable by the language barrier, but it was just like, you know, when you get the director of the game who worked on it for like five years or whatever, um, it, the passion sh shines through a little bit more. Um, and he... he also, I was surprised to see how big that thing was. Yeah, I was I was surprised by that as well. The the box was much larger than I was expecting. Um, yeah. So <laughs> the he that heavy feel. <laughs> that heavy, yeah, exactly that heavy feel. Um, so the the interesting thing about the limited edition in Europe versus the limited edition in the states is that the one in the states is different. There are two over there. One is a smaller special edition. And then you have the Master of Sword Edition, which is the full one with the statue and everything. Here, we've got this weird halfway between in Europe, 
we've just got one mm-hmm. limited edition that has the statue, but is missing like the carry case and everything that the, the Americans get. Hmm. Uh, regardless, we still get the best bit, which is the, the Master Sword statue. Um, and uh, but what what's also another interesting difference is that in America that thing sold out in seconds. I was up tweeting about the Nintendo press conference for Ready Up. And I was awake at the time, and I checked Amazon.com, and it was gone in like five minutes. And those were the only ones of the Master Edition. There were apparently some special editions were able to find in like game game spots and things. Uh, but the um, the the limited edition uh, or the Master Edition gone. Now, what's curious is that the limited edition in Europe is still available at the Nintendo UK store. Uh, whether they are incorrectly firing out their stock numbers, or they've just produced way more of them for Europe. Uh, I was able to put in the pre-order later that day, but when I say still available, I mean like now, like two or three weeks later after all this the Switch hype, uh, initial Switch hype I should say, um, you can still go get that limited edition. Um, it is limited one per customer, but it's there on the Nintendo Store. But it's there, yeah, and that's yeah. what matters. Uh, and also, weirdly enough, considering all of the sort of uh, scarcity of the, the Switch console from places like Game and whatever, um, it's still available on the Nintendo Store as well. Disclaimer, I don't work for the Nintendo UK Store, by the way. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I just noticed this. Uh, I'm not trying to sell you in one from there, but it's uh, curious that they supposedly have just still have stock and all of that. Um, and naturally, you'd think Nintendo would have the largest allotment of stock, but still, you know, you think you go into game or... Um, well, there's not really a lot of other places other than game on the high street these days, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, you think you go somewhere like that and uh, they'd be the first thing... Um, the, you, the first place you could get it, probably. But no, they've, they're all going into full... Stand, wait in line, get a ticket, all of this nonsense. Whereas you can just go to the Nintendo UK store and get it with like the Nintendo Breath of the Wild limited edition comes with an extra free cheap t shirt. It's just like, oh, okay, you guys have got lots of them. All right. <laughs> so uh, that's a curious difference between the, the, the allocation situation there with the stock. Um, what I'm curious about personally, so I should reveal at this point that I do indeed have a Switch pre order. Um, and for the first time in about 17 years, yeah, 16 years, since the since the GameCube came out, I've actually pre-ordered a PAL console, which is not something I do anymore. Uh, I've been an NTSEU gamer for some, some time. Uh, but because the Switch is supposedly region-free, uh, I, I've, I've taken a chance on it. I'm pretty sure I can get rid of it if that turns out to be a problem. Uh, so I do have a Switch pre-order. Not 100% certain I can afford £280 at the moment, to be honest. Uh, but I'm hoping I can sort of like sneak it in under my like my 30th, because my 30th birthday is in April. Um, so, good excuse to get stuff I couldn't normally afford. Uh, so I do have a Switch pre-order, and I do have a pre-order for that Breath of the Wild Limited Edition. Uh, but I'm curious when they're actually going to ship versus um, some of the other retailers. Nintendo mm. don't really mention any of that stuff on their site. I assume it'd be pretty quick. I assume it'd be close to launch. I hope it's launch day, but I can't. I can't assume that at the moment. Um, so I guess I'll find that out in future. Uh, oh, also Johnny says uh, that Farah skin is awesome. Farah, Farah, uh, Farah. Yeah. Um, are you talking about the icy one? Uh, I got that from the uh, the winter event. Uh, it's very World of Warcraft. It looks like Arthas, uh, if you know who that is. Um, so yeah, we got our we got our Breath of the Wild unboxing, and at the same time, just a couple of hours later, Nintendo of America put up their un- official unboxing of the console itself. Uh, it was very pre-scripted, of course. It's just like, ooh, here's the instructions for how to turn it on, and ooh. But they, they seem like they were genuinely happy to get one, even though they're they are inside the treehouse and probably yeah. filled with them. Um, so they're coming out of the areas. Yes, exactly. They've been using them all the time. Uh, they're in their full tracksuit, 
that says Nintendo Switch on it. Like, it looks oh, like yeah, what I'm no, wearing, it's, but, like, it's red. It's hilarious. Yeah. It's just, like, you got to admire the, like, total on-point branding yeah, absolutely. going on there. Um, so that unboxing is now available as well. Um, but I was more interested in the unboxings that showed off the sort of, you know, the tech stuff, the back-end features, the, the little niggly details you don't get out of press normally. Um, so that was cool. All right, so that's that's everything I have to say about unboxings. You'll be pleased to hear. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, over the next week, someone will get an actual unit and put a game in it, maybe? I know, mad. Um, but uh, since we're talking about the Switch anyway, uh, I thought I'd mention that uh, some other little niggly bits have come out. Uh, bits of bits and pieces of information. Uh, we got to see someone open up a box for one of the games. Woo. Yahoo! Uh, um... But as someone who uh, prides physical, like, I mean, I still buy a lot of games digitally, don't get me wrong. But as someone who grew up with piracy, I pride physical, digital, uh, physical boxes and packaging. Uh, I have a, a real soft spot for, for them uh, and keeping them in good condition and displaying them proudly on my shelf. Um, so I was pretty excited to see what the, the boxes were like for for the games that I'm not going to buy digitally, which will hopefully be a bit more now that it's region free. Um, oh, by the way, fantastic moment in the Overwatch video right now. You can't see it, but I accidentally created a wall with me, whose powers are ice, basically. Uh, and I interrupted a rogue Roadhog who was trying to hook in another player, and basically I just stuck a wall in between that, and I went, oops. I was, I was actually trying to help us, help our team, like, wall them off, keep, out, keep away the enemy team. But I screwed up, and uh, the the opposing player wasn't very happy. <laughs> uh, but anyway, back to the packaging. Uh, the packaging is, is pretty adorable. The cases look similar to the PlayStation Vita game cases. Uh, I mean, after all, it's basically just going to be a modified SD card, the game cartridges anyway. Uh, we're expecting in future for them to go up to 2 terabyte, uh, but closer to launch, it seems like the game cartridge sizes are going to be around 32 to 128 gigabyte. Uh, inside packaging on that game that was shown off, which was Bomberman R, uh, showed the inside as having like uh, this cute Bomberman pixel art, and the outside was very Japanese R. Like, if you ever saw the old GameCube Japanese boxes, they were sort of like half DVD cases. Uh... I, I, you would have really loved the Wind Waker Japanese box art. <laughs> um, uh, it's just like the a lot of the the sort of mur murals from Wind Waker, but like in a sort of like blue neon color. It's really cool. Uh, yeah, the packaging on the inside of the, that Bomberman R cart looks uh, awesome. Uh, sort of pixel art, and there's like it looks like there's space in the insert for like uh, a manual. Uh, which I hope means the return of some game manuals. The only game we've had confirmed that will to, to, to have to ship with a manual is the uh, the Binding of Isaac Plus uh, Afterbirth Plus, which was just announced as delayed. Unfortunately, it was yeah. it was due on launch day, but it's coming later in March for some reason. But as a, as an apology, Possibly because of a giant manual, I uh, yeah, <laughs> as an apo like as an apology, or because it was the reason it got delayed. Uh, mm. It's now going to come with a 20-page manual, which shouldn't be something we're now celebrating, but it is, because that is the industry now. You don't get manuals anymore, it seems, and which sucks. Uh, I grew up with, uh, as you know, Amigas and Commodore 64s and NESs, and I remember getting big manuals. Uh, I had those big PC-style boxes for my, PC, uh, for my Amiga games. The Secret of Monkey Island came with a, a code wheel as well, as an anti-security, uh, anti-piracy measure. Uh, so I miss all of that stuff. Uh, so I'm happy to see that in um, in the packaging for the Switch games. I'm cute. I'm obviously curious if there's a manual inside the Breath of the Wild box, but I'm gonna guess no. Um, so we got to see that. Uh, we also got um, from another source. We also got a more detailed impressions, uh, set of impressions on the new Pro controller for the Switch. Um, and I'm pretty excited about this. I quite like the one for the Wii U. Uh, it wasn't perfect because it wasn't matte. I'm not a big fan of shiny plastic. <laughs> um, 
But once you stuck a skin on there, the battery lasted for yonks. It was like 80 hours. Something ridiculous like that. It was absolutely, compared to like the other current gen consoles, uh, you compare a, 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 a DualShock 4, and most of the people I know who have PS4s at this point just sort of leave them plugged in. Because <laughs> uh, you probably get like 4 to 8 hours at best from a DualShock 4 these days. Uh, which is unfortunate because it's a really great controller otherwise. Uh, although I've heard really mixed uh, reports on the DualShock 4's build quality. Uh, mine is really good. I've got like a later one that has the PlayStation 1 skin on it. Uh, but I know some people who have some of the earlier black ones or some of the earlier red and blue ones uh, and like their analog sticks falling off and like really weird stuff there and the battery completely dying and uh, so the build quality seems to be a little bit all over the place. Uh, but I know that some people really didn't like the Wii U Pro's controller even though I did. Uh, some people thought it was sort of cheap and plasticky and a bit toy-like. Uh, however initial impressions of the Pro controller suggest it's a bit more of a premium product. Maybe not quite on the level of, say, the Xbox One Elite controller, which has like literally has pieces of metal in it, uh, mm. but uh, a step up from uh, the Wii U Pro controller. It has a nice semi-transparent shell, uh, which is evocative of the atomic purple uh, Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance. You might, uh, Aww, you might sweet remember. Memory. Sweet memories. <laughs> um, yeah. So that looks cool, and uh, and. The packaging, we got to see the packaging for it, and the packaging says on the box, uh, a single charge lasts about 40 hours. Now, what's interesting about this is that that's with the new rumble technology. That's not with the rumble technology off. Uh, the new HD rumble technology is similar to the gyroscopic rumble motors in the Xbox One controller. So it has degrees of rumble. It's not just vuh, 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 or, a, or a light vuh, vuh, vuh. It's like a, yeah. a progressive degree of, of rumble. Uh, apparently it's used to really good effect in the Joy-Con controllers for one of the 1-2 Switch games. Uh, but yeah, that's that's built into the Pro Controller as well, along with uh, an NFC reader for Amiibos. Uh, and uh, yeah, the initial impression suggests uh, it's, it's a quality product. Uh, shame about the price, but I feel less upset about the price now that I hear that it handles a 40 hour charge no problem. Uh, or 40 hour, 40, it lasts 40 hours. I wouldn't want to charge it for 40 hours. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's like between 59 and 60, 69 quid, depending where you find it in the UK, which just seems a bit much for a controller, but uh, if it is the premium version, I guess, of a controller, um, and it's going to significantly outlast the competition, then I can't be too angry. The only thing missing from it is it doesn't have analog triggers, uh, but I really only find that useful for like racing games. Uh, I haven't really, I can't really think of a game, for example, I use my Xbox One controller and my PC for my Steam library. Can't really think of a game where that's been super useful recently. The the analog contr uh, triggers. Can you think of any? No, not really. No. But I don't play a lot of racing games, so maybe I'm in yeah. the, maybe I'm in the minority there. Um, the main racing game I'd be playing on a Switch, to be honest, is probably a Mario Kart yeah, game. Mario anyway. Kart, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, that's that sounds good, and I'll probably at some point once I you know recover from purchasing a Switch, if I do pay, if I do go for it, which I think I'm. Uh, oh look, I got to play the game. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I will probably purchase the the Switch Pro Controller at some point. Uh, but I'm happy to stick with the Joy-Cons initially, because they seem decent enough. And I have indeed gone for the Neon console as well, because despite the fact those colours look a bit tacky in some press shots, I kind of like that, because I, I had the bright blue... Uh, well, I had the turquoise, let's say, uh, original 3DS. Um... And I will stand by that color. Um, yeah, it's not the same as the color that's on the Switch, though. No, no, it's not absolutely. But I mean, like uh, when you look at the Switch, they they kind of look sort of distractingly bright, and supposedly they look a lot better in real life. It's hard to tell though at this point. Um, but I will stand by weird console colors. Like, I wish I had a Spice GameCube. Um, I really like the yellow Game Boy Color, like all the all the sort of bright 
exhausting colours are actually <laughs> actually some of my favourite console colours. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's mostly it for the Switch, apart from one last little tidbit we got er earlier today, uh, where the amiibo functionality for uh, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild uh, was fully revealed. Uh, we had a little bit of information before what would happen if you used the old amiibos. Or I should say amiibo. It's not an e there's no S in it. Apparently it's already plural. Uh, the, <laughs> the old amiibo, like the 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 Smash, uh, the Twilight Princess slash Smash Brothers style Link, Zelda, etc. Uh, they would provide like extra health items in the game. Uh, but these new amiibo actually sound far more interesting. They'll do things like uh, the uh, the Bokoblin uh, or Bokoblin. Uh, the little uh, mini Ganon minions, uh, little pig monsters, they will provide a, a, a number of unique weapons. Uh, the Zelda amiibo will provide a unique shield, uh, or at least a sh uh, I assume you can probably get them in-game elsewhere, but maybe it's like you don't get it mu until yeah. much later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, although the colouring on the shield is very different from any other Zelda shield I've seen. Uh, so I wonder if it's unique to that amiibo. Uh, the Link on horseback uh, gives you like a new saddle for your horse and a sword and stuff. So sounds like some fairly substantial unlocks. Uh, again, I do hope that they are things you can acquire without the amiibo. Uh, I think that Super Mario Maker with a, had a really good compromise there. You could either use the amiibo to unlock uh, mystery costumes or you could complete the 100 Mario challenge uh, and unlock them that way. There was still an alternative avenue to get the content. Um, but hey, uh, I, I don't know at this point, and uh, it depends how big Zelda, uh, Breath of the Wild is already, whether they, they think they can justify that. I know that people have had mixed opinions on the expansion pass, for example. Uh, did you have any opinions on that? Have I lost you, Sue? I've lost you, Sue. Uh, that's okay. Uh, oh, we've got uh, a Russian viewer, I think? Pro 100 VLAD 1997. I'm going to assume you were born in 1997, Pro VLAD. Uh, yes, we... Um, uh... Oh, you're back! Yeah, sorry, that's why I got... You got distracted. Yeah, yeah, no, I got distracted by the Russian. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, I was just asking you if you had any opinions on the Zelda DLC pass. Um, um it's, I, it's. I'm really in a mixed expensive. place with it. With yeah, regards. yeah. I mean, like we've seen that kind of like more monetization and stuff started to creep through to Nintendo more, and because they resisted it for quite a very, long time, didn't they? Vehemently anti DLC until about 2011, mm. 2012. Mm. And then it started to sneak in a little bit with like Street Pass and things, the Street Pass games. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't mind. I feel like Breath of the Wild is probably big enough that I probably won't need the DLC. It's the probably more of a, a Witcher Blood and yeah, Wine situation. Yeah, exactly. That's where... what I think it. That's what I think it like, might be. That's what I'd hope it would like. And that's what like, I hope. You as know, well. at, at the time, like at the point where Nintendo was suddenly start saying, "Pay some extra money to get the cool shields." Yes. Without buying the cool figure. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's you unlock that shield. That would be where I'd be like, mm. Mm, I'll be a yeah, little bit more yeah. forgiving yep. because they are bundling it with an amiibo, which looks pretty sweet. But, but yeah, oh, oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll see this. Like start to come up a bit more with with them um, in the future. Uh, one one half of me is looking forward to it in regards to the Mario Kart Eight example. Uh, I felt uh, like the DLC in that was fairly. That was, priced. that was very good. Yeah, it was yeah. fairly priced. You got like what sixteen tracks, something like that, um, across the two DLC packs, uh, yeah. which you could buy at once for a reasonable price. Um, mm. Oh man, I'm actually having a good round as Hanzo. I'm terrible. I was going to say you're doing really well. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm really. I'm bad at Hanzo. Uh, but I guess I was just remembering what his powers were. Well, or I don't know. I was in this. Yeah, you had you had a massive kill streak going on there. Yeah, I think uh, I might have gotten play of the game from that. We'll find out at the end of this match. Um, 
but yes, uh, so on one yeah on one side you look at Mario Kart, and on another and uh, on this by the same token you look at the exceptional free DLC we got for Splatoon and Mario Maker, a uh, whole bunch of extra mystery costumes, uh, event levels for Mario Maker, a uh, whole bunch of different weapons, new weapons for Splatoon, uh, and all of that stuff was free. Um, so what's interesting is that the DLC so far that's cost money has been for sing for single player things actually. Uh, I mean, I guess Mario Kart's also multiplayer, but um, the the free DLC was for the the, the sort of online connectivity game <laughs> games. So that that's interesting. I wonder if um, there's a part of their like. I wonder if internally they're thinking, uh, and I hope not. But I wonder if internally they're thinking we can chop this bit of the game off, um, yeah, and release it as single player DLC. But I don't know; it's all speculation at this point. Uh, I just hope that Nintendo doesn't go too far down that route. I'm quite happy to pay uh, nineteen ninety nine dollars or seventeen ninety nine pounds. Yeah, that's the conversion rate um, for an expansion pass. If uh, the story stuff it adds in the the second part of the pass is, is substantial. Uh, and I'm actually one of the few people who will want that hard mode for in the first part of the pass uh, because I totally did the Wind Waker hard mode, uh, mm -hmm. the hero mode. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is a fantastic uh, sort of semi Souls like mode. I don't know if you've played it, but the basically hearts don't respawn. Yeah. Uh, so it becomes a race to get bottles as soon as possible. <laughs> it's, uh, which is really funny it's like oh god I've just finished the what do you call it, Dragon Roost Island and you're like I should be going to the, the Kokiri tree now but instead I'm going to scour the sea for another bottle because I need <laughs> more bottles for these dungeons <laughs> I need I need my fairies man uh, so yeah uh, if, it's, if it's something like that and it makes it a bit more survival-y uh, I'm all about that I also did the hero mode in A Link Between Worlds on the 3DS a hundred percent at that actually, because A Link Between Worlds was just so fantastic. Um, it's probably one of the games that uh, I reviewed at Ready Up that I wish I'd rated higher. <laughs> I gave it a nine. Uh, really? Yeah, I did give it a nine. I was like, it's a, it's an almost pitch perfect sequel to the original Link to the Past. It's like, why did you give it a nine and not ten? Because I thought they they did some breaking of the formula, like they took the the Link to the Past formula, but they broke up uh, the order you could progress the dungeons in, going yeah. back to a la Zelda 1. Yeah. Uh, and I believe Mark Brown has an interesting video about that up now. Uh, but yeah, a la Zelda 1, where you could sort of do the dungeons in any order, uh, they broke up that with the rental system in A Link yeah, Between Worlds, yeah, where you yeah. could rent the, the, the items rent you wanted. Rent the uh, items, yeah. Um, and so, the reason I gave it a 9, despite the fantastic music, it being merely a perfect sequel, which is very, very rare to do, uh, while also being sort of a great homage to the original, uh, the reason I gave it a 9 is because I thought that Nintendo were really only getting started with breaking the formula. Uh, I love the Zelda formula. Like, uh, Ocarina of Time, you know, Wind Waker, some of my favourite games ever. But they did get sort of stuck in that three dungeon, then eight dungeon cycle. Three dungeon, get Mar Master Sword, five to eight dungeons, finish the game. Um, that was the sort of cycle they were stuck in with, like, Ocarina, Majora's Mask, uh, Twilight Princess, Wind Waker, blah blah blah. Skyward Sword. Uh, and then they broke that to pieces a little bit in uh, A Link Between Worlds. And so the reason I gave it a nine is because I thought this could be, this is them starting to experiment with the formula again. And I think they can do so much more if they take this experimentation and apply it to a 3D Zelda. Um, and that's, I guess that's what's happening with Breath of the Wild. I mean, we'll find out if it was a success in about a week and a half. Um, but, uh, fingers crossed. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pretty hyped about the Switch, despite the fact that there's really only one game for it. Uh, See, that's the reason that I haven't pre-ordered the Switch. And I don't blame anyone for that. Uh, in fact, yeah. if, if if there wasn't a quote-unquote superior version of Breath of the Wild coming out at launch, I would have just left the Switch until uh, Mario Odyssey. Because that's really the other killer app. Uh, mm. That is That looks like a proper Mario 64 sequel, and that's enough to sell me a system any day. 
But it was like the... Uh, I left the Wii U for like a year and a half. I left the PS4 for almost two years. Uh, I didn't pick up a PS4 until Bloodborne. Uh, and to be honest, uh, apart from a, little, a couple of other games, we'll be talking about one of them in a second, but apart from a couple of other exclusives, most of the games I could get on a PS4 I can get on my PC and run better. Um, so, yeah, you really... I, I used to tell myself, you know what, this console needs five exclusives for me to invest in it. Uh, but now it seems like it needs one, because <laughs> we're just running out. <laughs> um, but whatever, whatever. I'll justify the Switch on the basis of my birthday. Uh, otherwise, I probably wouldn't be doing it. But hey, the good news with that is if I do have a Switch, uh, maybe our viewers can expect a Breath of the Wild stream. Hmm. Mm, so, that would be that would be really cool. That would be really cool around launch. I might wait until I'm like an hour into the game and I've like actually started the game game. Like, I don't want to go into yeah. story you don't want to... yeah, yeah, I don't really want to go into story spoilers. I just kind of want to run around the field and show off the game. Um, when it comes to all the... I'm, I'm, I'm such a sucker for the Zelda story. Like, I'm, I'm the guy who has the timeline worked out. I'm that guy, unfortunately. Um, so, I want to absorb all of that properly. Um, so, I'll probably do some... But I'll probably do some streams where I'm messing around and riding around the field and uh, just checking out what's up with Hyrule. Uh, so, our viewers can look forward to that if they're interested. Um, but yeah, I think I think we're probably done with the Switch now. Uh, it's a fairly exhaustive until the next thing, <laughs> until the next yeah. thing happens in a week. Like like uh, not yeah. even a week. Like in the twenty four hours, <laughs> someone will be like, "Oh, uh, uh, well." The other thing that happened was a, uh, the German site took it apart. I think later, but I haven't even looked at that. Um, oh, well, the hype train is in full force. Yes, so the hype train is in full force. I don't know where else it can go. Uh, mm. I I have some criticisms though. Having said all this like exciting positive stuff I want to know what the hell's going on with the virtual console even though the virtual console on the Wii and the Wii U wasn't great in terms of emulation it's actual emulation quality wasn't fantastic uh, oh by the way I did get played in the game um, in Overwatch uh, but yeah the actual emulation quality of specifically NES games was always really dark mm. the, the, they used a filter to try and like I think they were worried about screen burning on plasmas or something, but it's ridiculous when you compare it against, like, say, a custom home emulation solution, cough, cough, raspberry pi, uh, the quality of the emulation was really low. Um, the best things that were emulated on the virtual console were N64 games, because N64 games are hard to emulate anyway, so to have a professionally done by Nintendo versions of those games uh, was pretty pretty great. So, I want to know about the Virtual Console, and I want to know how the heck my purchases transfer over if they do. Now, what happened with the Wii to the Wii U was that they, uh, they moved... Um, they've registered the fact that you bought the game previously on the Wii, and then they offered an upgrade to the Wii U version for about $1.50. Uh, mm -hmm. Which, to be honest, that's about... Any more than that, and you're kind of... You start to lose me, but a dollar fifty, that's okay, especially for an N sixty four upgrade. Um, if I can get my Wii U library, Wii slash Wii U library of N sixty four purchases on the Switch, um, which are now tied to my Nintendo account, by the way, because they're finally, finally unifying the platforms. <laughs> <Ugh>. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to welcome to nineteen ninety eight Nintendo. Um, mm. If they can uh, give me the discounts for that, or even free upgrades, that but that's living in a dream world. Uh, if they can give me like a dollar fifty upgrade for all of my games, uh, I'm more than likely to port a few of them over to the Switch because the Switch has the added benefit of being a portable. Uh, I think having uh, Mario sixty four uh, in well, not in my pocket, in my bag, I guess, um, would be awesome. Uh, Ocarina of Time, uh, Harvest Moon 64 is coming out this week on the Wii U Virtual Console, which is a really strange thing to release this week, specifically. Mm. Um, but that's good news anyway, because I don't think that ever had a proper European release, or if it did, it was extremely limited. Um, so it's coming out on both the NTSEU and PAL eShops. Um, 
So yes, I do have some I do have some worries about the eShop, or the new eShop I should say. I don't think it's even going to be called the eShop at this point, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think it did say eShop in the menu, but the way Nintendo's moving away from the Nintendo Network ID uh, to a Nintendo account, yes, they are separate things, uh, is, uh, is concerning in terms of... Uh, uh, how they're going to handle that account system, but at the very least I did notice that my Nintendo account had tracked all of my Nintendo Network ID purchases. So, uh, we'll see how that turns out in a week and a half. <laughs> uh. Anyway, I think we should move on from the Switch. Yeah. Uh, That's... <laughs> unless you've got any headlines for me, although we do have, we did get one piece of news we could, we could bring up. I mean, I, I don't know what we'll say about it because neither of us have read the article. Uh, but as we uh, were... well, to be fair, the article was very short. That the article was literally just three paragraphs. Oh, is it okay? Comprised of like a maximum of ten sentences. And then well, for anyone watching this before they read it, um, apparently they have announced a Mass Effect expansion to Cards Against Humanity, which is like. What? <laughs> it's like one of the cards just gonna say Rex, and the other card's gonna say Shepherd, and then you have to combine. Uh, I don't know how it's gonna work. Um, blank. I thought you were talking about the other piece of news. So. Uh, blank was found uh, doing this on the Citadel. Um, insert your own <laughs> word. Uh, no. Uh, oh, you are you talking about the other Nintendo-related piece of news? Yeah, I was talking about that, but... Um... I don't actually know anything about that article, uh, or, or what happened there, but uh, rest in peace, a uh, person at Nintendo of America who unfortunately passed away. One of the initial founders, I believe? Um, yeah. Co-founded Fire Studio back in 1979, used the company to import Nintendo arcade cabinets. Oh, nice. In 81, he co-founded Nintendo of America, where he worked as vice president. And worked there for over a decade before becoming CEO of Sega Entertainment in 1994. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that was Alan Stone. Oh, I have heard that name before, yeah. As one of the people who brought Nintendo to the West, and he has died at the age of 71. That's unfortunate news. Uh, RIP mm. then, because, uh, I mean, Nintendo, whether for selfish reasons or not, basically, quote-unquote, saved the industry in the 80s. Mm. Um we could probably say for selfish reasons, but uh, yeah, so that's that's a shame. Uh, but let's move on to our last topic, I guess, uh, for tonight, because I don't think there's any other breaking news unless I've missed something. Um, now, for this, I'm going to have to dive away to the BRB screen for a second, because I'm going to have to change the video I've got up. Uh, I actually still have like 20 minutes left of Overwatch footage, but I think we'll stop there. Um, <laughs> and uh, move on. So, let's go to the BRB screen for a second. I'm just trying to look up this um, Cards Against Humanity Mass Effect thing, and all I keep getting are like um, fan created versions. Yeah. Um, one of which has a white card that just simply says Caden's ass on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, that that's that's one you set up. Sounds uh, about right, isn't it? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You, your Caden was a gentleman. <laughs> he was. Um, so let me grab this one second. Uh, it's in the OBS folder. And is that it there? No, this is too rich for my blood. All right, I'll have to maybe watch a little bit because. Uh, this video is only nine minutes long, uh, so you can you can keep an eye on it for me. Although I can just set it to repeat indefinitely. Um, I'll probably do that actually. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't you do that? Because I doubt you'll be able to keep your thoughts to nine minutes. <laughs> less hey, hey. <laughs> no, you're you're right. You're right. Uh, so let's hit play on that. Bring us back. Hey, there we go. And our final topic for tonight is uh, I recently, finally, finally played The Last of Us. Everyone's Game of the Year 2013. Why the hell did it take you so long? <laughs> Why the heck did it take me so long? Well, uh, part of it was um, I was 
I played a little bit at the beginning at a friend's house, and man, the intro to that game is depressing. Oh yeah, it's super incredible, depressing. Incredible. Um, so, but I, I, I told myself I would have to get around to this. Like, it was one of those games like Red Dead Redemption that I've left too long. Uh, yeah, still haven't played. Um, and uh, the remastered version, which came out fairly early on in the PS4's lifespan, uh, was the perfect excuse to do so. So I actually picked this up fairly uh, when I got my PS4, like just over a year ago. I actually got this soon after, um, and with the announcement of The Last of Us Part Two, finally decided to dive into it uh, uh, about a week and a half ago. And I basically beat it over the course of three long sessions. Mm. Um, it's probably about 15-ish hours long, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, if, you, if you're if you trying to take your time and collect everything you can. Um, and they, pretty, they did a pretty damn good job with this remaster, it's got to be said. Uh, I remember the game running quite well for a PS3 game when it came out. Uh, but here it runs at ne- like between 40 and 60 frames a second. And the additional smoothness really makes a difference to the combat. Uh, because uh, I heard a lot of people having issues with the combat uh, upon its initial release. It feels like they've tightened mm. it up a little bit in this version. Um, so it, it runs well. It looks pretty stunning most of the time. Uh, I mean, they were pushing the PS3 to its <coughs> absolute breaking point. And now with the PS4, with the additional overhead, they've just up some of the textures, they've smoothed out some of the character models, thrown in some extra lighting effects, and of course it runs at a much better frame rate. Uh, so it looks pretty fantastic. Uh, Naughty Dog know what they're doing when it comes to tech, generally speaking. Uh, those were the guys who figured out on the PS1 how to like double the number of polygons you could render in 3D. Um, there's a great story about that, how, about how they were trying to outdo Mario 64, uh, which they knew they could never do. But while they were doing that, they've worked out how to render uh, art better in uh, 3D models better in Crash Bandicoot. Um, so yeah, Naughty Dog go way back in terms of pushing PlayStation tech to its limits. Um, so yeah, I uh, finally got into this. Uh, my brief summary is that it is an incredible story uh, with some amazing character moments, uh, some really dark, dark stuff. Mm. Um, I've intentionally recorded this bit of the game because really all that happens here is just some violence. Uh, but there's some other stuff that happens as well. Um a uh, lot of just depressing overtones, uh, but it's a really, it's a well-realized dystopia. Uh, lots of fantastic world b- uh, building and attention to detail. Um, that said, um, I wasn't. Uh, I, I did have some minor issues with the gameplay. Uh, totally serviceable, and actually, in the clips I'm showing you right now, I actually don't have too much problems, uh, too much trouble. Uh, compared to when I was playing it the first time. Maybe I got more used to it by the end of the game. Uh, but I found the init- the gunplay and like using s- items in- from stealth initially fairly cumbersome. Uh, it's very... The word I would use to describe it is deliberate. <laughs> very deliberate. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing, because it forces you to evaluate your options con- consistently. Uh, you're going for that stealth action, generally speaking. But if you don't like stealth, you're going to have a lot of problems with this game, which is a shame, because uh, I, I think a lot of people would really enjoy uh, the story. Um, speaking of which, I will not get into spoilers, uh, but it had a, a pretty fantastic uh, sort of hmm, hmm ending. Mm. Not, not, the fairly o- not the obvious, like, we tied up everything ending. Uh, but also not a super depressing. This is the worst end. Just an ending that we made you think. Hmm. So just enough to give it a bit of edge. A bit, a bit of an edge, but there's still hope, basically. Uh, and so that left me pretty psyched for uh, the Last of Us Part Two, and also gave me context for that trailer that I tweeted about and did not understand at the time. <laughs> um. Other things that they've done really well with this remaster is uh, once you've finished it once, uh, you can go back to any point in the game via chapter select. So it basically lets you return to any major encounter area. Uh, And it'll tell you how many collectibles you've got in that area. It'll tell you... um, uh, You can, can, like, 
carry over your equipment and stuff in a New Game Plus way. Uh, there is actually also a separate New Game Plus mode, but you can also use it via that chapter select. Uh, you can watch all the cutscenes again. Um, there are a whole bunch of unlockable skins. So I haven't got any in this footage, unfortunately, but there's like a Naughty Dog t-shirt that you can put on Joel, uh, <laughs> which is just fantastic. Um, so yeah, really, they, they, they did a really bang-up job with this remaster. Plus, it includes, and I have not played yet, but it includes uh, The Last of Us Left Behind. Which that was my that was what I was going to ask. Like, does that mean that you're now ready to dive into? I'm you? ready to dive into that because it even on the main menu you can select it right from the get go. If you've been like if you knew this game inside out on the PS3 and you just wanted to move on to the new stuff, maybe you didn't get the DLC on the PS3. Hmm. Uh, you can jump straight into The Last of Us, but it comes up with a massive warning saying you should probably do this after the main game. Uh, so I'm ready for that now. Uh, and my understanding is that it's a prequel, and I'll say no more. Um, yeah. But uh, I'm looking forward to trying that out. Uh, it's uh, apparently quite short, like three to five hours, uh, but it has uh, some... Um, not controversial, what was the word I'm looking for? Uh, Well-received uh, character traits, let's say. Uh, they tackled some issues that aren't normally tackled in games, or at least are still being tackled in their infancy. Uh, stuff like LGBT themes and such. Um, so I'll look forward to checking that out and see how it compares against the main experience. But man, the main experience is just such a such a journey of up and down and up and down. Um, uh, depression. Oh, we're actually making some progress here. Oh no, back to everything being horrible. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I still recommend it for anyone who thinks they can handle it without feeling you know too overwhelmed. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, and even if you have to play it on, like on easy, if you don't like the stealth and have to play it on easy, it's still worth experiencing. Um, and I can understand the people who call this like Naughty Dog's masterpiece or whatever. Um, I get it. I understand it. I don't know if I necessarily agree a hundred percent, but it is fantastic in terms of story. Um, so yeah, that gets a that gets a thumbs up from Scott. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, the other thing is, you can get it really cheap. Like you can find it for like a tenner, um, the remastered version. Uh, I got it for like fifteen dollars from the states, including shipping. So uh, even though I could have just bought the UK copy, I wanted to buy the US copy in case there were any problems with the DLC. Um, because it also has a multiplayer mode, which I have not tried, but I hear there is a bit of a community for. Uh, and man, there are a ton of like map packs and things to download for the multiplayer. So I guess it's fairly active still. Um, so some people must like the combat a lot in this game. <laughs> As I say, it is deliberate, so uh, that is something you can adjust to, I imagine. Uh, but yeah, uh, looking forward to The Last of Us Part 2. We don't really have a confirmed release for that yet, do we? Um, they sort of were vaguely hinting at the PlayStation experience last year that it would be 2017, but I think it's probably going to be 2018 at this rate. Uh, given that we've got other heavy hitters this year, like uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, and we've got, uh, um, I'm thinking of Sony exclusives here. Um, I actually don't know what else is hitting Sony this year. <laughs> uh, that's a big, admittedly, that's a pretty huge one. But like when I think of the other stuff, you know, like you yourself pointed out that Nino Kuni is now coming to the PC. Yep. Um, Bloodborne's already out. Any Souls game is probably going to end up on the PC as well. Uh, I guess Neo um, is technically an exclusive at the moment. So that's a sort of Souls-like. It's not entirely Souls game, but it's very similar in some aspects. Um, so I guess there's that. Uh, and between that, Yakuza and um, Horizon Zero Dawn. That's a pretty good range of stuff, I suppose, for the rest of the year. Uh, it just seems like they're all front-loaded. That's what I'm worried about. I don't see much happening at the end of the year for Sony. Uh, a lot of really awesome stuff in the first couple of months. Like, uh, Yakuza Zero is hilarious. So, uh, lots of really great stuff. Oh, whatever. We'll see where that goes. Um, so, to wrap up, do we have... Um, Oh, STD Jager asks, uh, Wiz is a GTA. No, this isn't GTA. This is The Last of Us. 
Uh, it does have a similar third-person camera in combat, though, now that you point that out. Yeah, that's that's kind of what uh, the combat was like in GTA V, actually. It was massively improved over previous games, but it was very deliberate as well. Um, so that's an interesting point. Um, but yeah, unless we've got any Q&A to get through, um, which I was thinking of adding to this show, uh, but we don't have any questions yet, obviously. Um, <laughs> I think we're ready to wrap up for our for our first episode. Um, yeah, probably. I was. I'm still not over like how much switch stuff there was for something that's not even. Exactly. It's just a. It's just a flood of nonsense. Mm. And like, I, admittedly, I was diving into some deep stuff there, but there's probably stuff I've missed even in that whole summary. Like, it's just nuts for a console that's only really got one killer app. Um, that is a Wii U game. Uh, like. I'm sure it'll have some incredible games eventually, and by the end of the year even. Um, but for such a light launch, let's say, the hype around that thing's been insane. Um, but hey, I'm happy to get in on that once in a while. So, I'll look forward to that. Uh, I think we're about ready to wrap up, so what do you think? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Whatever okay. you want to do. Well, uh, for anyone who's watching this, or is watching the archive of this, uh, please, please give me your feedback. I'd love your feedback. Uh, get in touch with us by Twitter at ReadyUp. Uh, in fact, all of our social links are in the bottom right-hand corner of our, our new overlay I put together. Uh, ReadyUp.net is where we write our stuff and post our video archives. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter as ReadyUp. And we're on YouTube and Twitch as ReadyUp Video, where you can catch our, our archives and our live streams. Uh, we'll be streaming probably again at 8 p.m. on 8 p.m. GMT on Friday. I uh, don't know what that'll be, though. Uh, that'll be our casual Friday stream, where we play a mixture of multiplayer shenanigans. Um, so hopefully some fun stuff there. We had a great uh, couple of Ultimate Chicken uh, Horse matches last week. Uh, unfortunately, I realised halfway through that my mic had been muted, but whatever. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? Um, so yeah, I'm going to head over to the, uh, the goodbye screen. Thanks. And uh, thank you to anybody who stuck with us for the whole stream. Uh, and I hope you all have a lovely week. Uh, and it's goodbye from me, Scott. Uh, it's bye from me, Susan. And we'll hopefully see you on Friday. Bye-bye!